today, um, we're going to be uh, taking a deep dive into resuscitation. Okay. And uh, we're going to be covering a range of scenarios, including newborn resuscitation, right. cardiac arrest in adults and during pregnancy, and uh, the latest guidelines on cuffed endotracheal tubes and managing anaphylaxis. Sounds good. Let's start with the difficult topic of newborn resuscitation and when we might consider stopping oh, wow. these efforts. Yeah, this must be an incredibly challenging decision to face. Yeah. What factors play into that decision? Well, it's a sensitive situation. Yeah. After 20 minutes of effective CPR with no return of spontaneous circulation, right. termination can be considered. Yeah. This is especially true if there have been no signs of life after 10 minutes. 10 minutes feels like both a very short and a very long time in that situation. Yeah. What needs to happen before making that call? Before even considering termination, it is crucial to address all reversible causes. Like what? What kind of things are we talking about? These might include things like hypoxia, hypovolemia, right. or metabolic disturbances. Okay. Ethical considerations are also paramount, particularly if the infant has a poor prognosis due to severe congenital anomalies. And how do you engage with the family yeah. during such a difficult conversation? Well, compassionate communication is key. Yeah. We need to clearly explain the infant's condition, the prognosis, and the rationale behind considering termination. It is a time for shared decision making. We must respect the family's wishes while also providing our expert medical guidance. Yeah, shared decision making is so crucial in these emotionally charged moments. Now let's shift gears and talk about N-tidal carbon dioxide monitoring, often called ETCO2 during CPR. Most healthcare providers know about ETCO2, but do we truly understand its significance? I know I don't always feel confident interpreting those numbers. Yeah, ETCO2 is a powerful tool. Okay. It gives us a non-invasive look at how effective our CPR efforts are. Think of it as a real-time indicator of perfusion. Higher ETCO2 levels typically correlate with better blood flow and increase the chances of return of spontaneous circulation. So seeing those ETCO2 numbers rise is a good sign. Mm -hmm. Are there specific thresholds we should be aware of? Yes. Okay. For example, an abrupt increase above 10 millimeters of mercury can signal return of spontaneous circulation. Wow. Sometimes even before a palpable pulse is detected. Oh, interesting. Conversely, consistently low values less than 10 millimeters of mercury suggest inadequate compressions or potentially a poor prognosis. So it's about more than just getting the heart beating again. Mm -hmm. We need adequate perfusion for a meaningful recovery. Exactly. Research shows that reaching an ETCO2 level of at least 20 millimeters of mercury within 20 minutes of CPR significantly boosts the chances of successful resuscitation. Okay, so that's a concrete number we can all aim for. Mm -hmm. 20 millimeters of mercury within 20 minutes. Yeah. Now let's move on to a topic where guidelines have been evolving. Okay. I remember being taught to never use cuffed endotracheal tubes in young children. Right. But things seem to be changing. You're right. While uncuffed tubes were the standard for years, cuffed endotracheal tubes are now recommended for patients of any age. This is because they provide a better seal, minimizing air leaks, and potentially reducing the need for tube exchanges. That makes sense. Okay. A better seal means less risk of air leaks and aspiration. When would that be especially important? Think about procedures like laparoscopic surgery mm -hmm. or in patients who are prone to aspirating. Uh -huh. In those situations, a secure airway is critical. But what about the risk of airway injury with cuffed tubes, mm -hmm. especially in those tiny airways? That's a valid concern, especially yeah. with oldal cuff designs. But the development of low-pressure cuffs has significantly reduced the risk of airway trauma. This makes cuffed endotracheal tubes a safer option for all patients, even younger ones. That's reassuring to know. So does this mean cuffed tubes are always the best choice? Not necessarily. Individualized clinical judgment remains paramount. We still need to weigh the benefits of enhanced airway control against any potential risks on a case-by-case -case basis. Speaking of high-stakes scenarios, let's talk about cardiac arrest in pregnancy. Okay. It's a double emergency with the lives of both the mother and baby at stake. Right. What are the immediate priorities in such a situation? The absolute priority is maternal resuscitation. High-quality CPR is crucial. That means focusing on effective chest compressions and rescue breaths. But we also can't forget the anatomical changes that come with pregnancy. Yeah. You're talking about the gravid uterus. Right. How does that impact our response? The gravid uterus can compress the aorta and vena cava, reducing blood flow back to the heart. Wow. To counteract this, we perform left lateral uterine displacement. Okay. This simple maneuver can improve maternal circulation significantly. 
So we're tilting the patient to our left side. What else do we need to keep in mind? Time is critical. If return of spontaneous circulation is not achieved within four to five minutes, we need to consider a paramortem cesarean section, especially if the fetus is beyond 23 weeks gestation. Wow, a paramortem cesarean section? That's a major intervention. It is. Delivering the baby relieves pressure on the mother's major vessels, improving her chances of survival. Right. We're essentially buying her time. Now, this might seem counterintuitive, yeah. but I've heard that fetal monitoring is discouraged during a paternal cardiac arrest. Right. Why wouldn't we monitor both patients? It's a good question. The guidelines recommend removing fetal monitors during maternal cardiac arrest. The rationale is that focusing on the mother's resuscitation is paramount. The fetal outcome is directly linked to her survival. Right. Distractions can be deadly in this situation. So laser focus on the mother first and foremost. Then if she's stabilized, we can reassess the fetal situation. Exactly. We need to prioritize the most critical intervention at that moment. Right. And that is resuscitating the mother. That makes a lot of sense. Now let's talk about the period after a successful resuscitation. Okay. We got the heart beating again, but how do we protect the brain from further damage? That's where targeted temperature management or TTM comes in. This is a controlled cooling process where we lower the patient's core body temperature to between 32 and 36 degrees Celsius okay. for 12 to 24 hours. Cooling the body down seems counterintuitive after such a traumatic event. What's the benefit of that? Think of TTM as hitting the pause button on cellular damage. By cooling the body, we slow down brain metabolism and reduce oxygen demand. We are also dampening the inflammatory response that often follows cardiac arrest. This gives the brain a chance to recover and minimizes secondary injury. Wow. It's amazing how much we can influence recovery with something as seemingly simple as temperature control. Uh -huh. Are there specific considerations with this procedure? TTM requires specialized equipment and expertise. We need cooling devices, temperature probes, and continuous monitoring systems. We're closely tracking the patient's core temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, and other vital signs. It's not a simple intervention. So this isn't something we can just implement with a few ice packs? Definitely not. Yeah. TTM should only be performed in a setting with the necessary resources and expertise. And even then, there are no guarantees, right? Unfortunately not. TTM can significantly improve neurological outcomes, but some patients may still experience long-term cognitive impairments despite our best efforts. Yeah. The human body is complex and doesn't always respond predictably. Exactly. That's a good reminder that medicine is not always black and white. We do our best with the knowledge and tools we have. Right. Now let's switch gears one last time for this section. Okay. We're going to tackle a condition that demands immediate decisive action. Anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is a life-threatening allergic reaction that requires a swift and coordinated response. Absolutely. Every second counts in this situation. What are the first steps we need to take? The initial steps are twofold. First, immediately remove the allergen if possible. Okay. This could be a medication, food, or insect sting. Get the trigger away from the patient, then what? Next, administer intramuscular epinephrine into the outer mid-thigh without delay. Okay. Epinephrine is the first-line treatment for anaphylaxis. There's no time to waste. Epinephrine is the go-to drug in this scenario. Yeah. What if a single dose isn't enough? If we don't see improvement within five minutes, we can administer additional doses of epinephrine as needed. Okay. We need to be aggressive in managing anaphylaxis, but we also need to be monitoring for any adverse reactions. So epinephrine first, then what other supportive measures are crucial? We also provide supportive care, including high flow oxygen and intravenous access for rapid fluid resuscitation. This is especially important if the patient is hypotensive. We're supporting breathing and circulation while the epinephrine does its job. Yeah. What about ongoing monitoring? Close monitoring is critical for at least four hours due to the risk of biphasic anaphylaxis. This is when symptoms can recur even after initial treatment. Biphasic anaphylaxis sounds like something I need to learn more about. That delayed reaction is certainly something we need to be aware of. Yeah. It seems like even when the patient seems to be recovering well, we can't let our guard down too soon. Exactly. They still need close observation for a few hours to ensure the reaction is truly resolved. But what about other medications like bronchodilators or corticosteroids? Do they have a role to play? Bronchodilators can certainly help open up the airways, 
but they should never delay the administration of epinephrine. Right. Remember, epinephrine is our primary weapon against the life-threatening effects of anaphylaxis. Right. It works quickly to counteract that allergic cascade. So epinephrine takes priority, and then we can consider adding bronchodilators if needed. Right. What about corticosteroids? Corticosteroids help reduce inflammation, but their effects are delayed. Okay. They are not a substitute for epinephrine. Gotcha. Think of corticosteroids as a potential way to prevent a biphasic reaction or to manage lingering symptoms, but they're not our immediate go-to in the acute phase of anaphylaxis. That makes sense. So corticosteroids play a role in the bigger picture. Right. But epinephrine is king when it comes to acute management. Resuscitation is about more than just technical skills. Compassion, empathy, and clear communication are essential. We must guide patients and families through some of the most challenging moments in their lives. You are absolutely right. As we continue to advance our knowledge and refine our techniques, we must never lose sight of the human element of resuscitation. We hope you found this discussion insightful and helpful. Until next time, keep learning, keep questioning, and keep striving to provide the best possible care to your patients. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.